My name is Jason Flato, professor of philosophy at Perimeter College on the Clarkston campus. The city is a site of structural forces and macro trends, and we need to know how these trends affect people on the ground. These structures and agents both enable and contradict each other. The different parts of the city, for example, let's say property taxes, MARTA, gang leaders, small businesses, and the city council, all come together to create a very specific site of capitalist social relations. The city is a complex, variegated whole, and we need to zoom in and out of differing levels of analysis. The idea is when we ask, what does housing injustice look like? We want to know exactly what that means. And to figure that out, we need to interrogate these, those structural processes that produce and reproduce injustice. But we also need a more granular vantage point from all sorts of disciplines so we can ultimately chip away at the problem. Now, as a philosopher, I'm interested in grasping social reality. Part of that means showing what we think is natural is often not natural. Philosophy, then, reveals a glimpse of something more desirable and necessary than what already exists. In this sense, the philosopher is also working through and relating the innovations that come to it from non-philosophical fields. So the interdisciplinary nature of wicked problems braids all sorts of nodes that can work to offset suffering and misery. I have both teaching and research projects connected to wicked problems. I offer a course that interrogates wicked problems that persist in the Atlanta metropolitan area such as transportation, food insecurity, and affordable housing. Students are connected with community partners, stakeholders, and experts to address and work in teams to propose a solution to one of these interdisciplinary wicked problems. In turn, they get hands-on experience thinking through ethical problems from a variety of different lenses. I've also done a lot of thinking about housing inequality in terms of egalitarianism and theories of justice. Elizabeth Anderson, a philosopher, points out that a theory of justice should bring into view the interdependency of persons through social relationships of the division of labor and the institutional rules and practices of social cooperation. So, when we regard the society as a system of cooperation in which members are interdependent, then promoting justice does not reduce to policies that redistribute the good or ill effects of bad luck after the fact. Rather, we should be asking as well whether those institutional rules, social practices, and structural relations can be reformed so that they produce less undeserved inequality to start with. To make progress on this, I draw on Jerry Cohen's work. What's important for me is that his community principle constrains the equality of opportunity principle such that the latter admits too many inequalities or even worse, backslides into a dumb logic of personal responsibility and in turn contradicts community. Cohen understands the principle of community as something that compromises or limits justice. But instead, why shouldn't community specify precisely what justice requires of us? This socialist equality of opportunity then would require community-friendly, not market-friendly equality of opportunity. That's where I'm at right now, but pushing these ideals of community and hospitality as a way to think through housing inequality seems promising. So I have to preface this by saying that I can't speak for the discipline of the philosophy, which is at best a constant site of contestation. So I'll answer from my own perspective as a philosopher. Certainly one wor very worthwhile way of looking at fundamental philosophical problems is to see them as social contradictions abstractly conceived. These contradictions appear as practical problems without solutions, reflected in cultural dilemmas. Philosophy treats them as theoretical antinomies, insoluble conundrums over which we struggle without reaching a convincing solution or consensus. They include the antinomies of value and fact, freedom and necessity, individual and society, and ultimately subject and object. I think we can also include wicked problems here. This approach means that philosophical problems are significant insofar as they reflect social contradictions. On the other hand, philosophy cannot resolve the problems it identifies because to be perfectly blunt, only a social revolution can eliminate their causes. 
This is Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So working out of these kinds of assumptions will yield a bunch of different approaches and a bunch of different questions. For example, how best to offset the gross inequality with regards to housing under the totalizing effects of capitalism? What does a political economy of housing look like? In what ways does housing struggles interface with class struggles? What is the role of the state with regards to housing? And for one last example, philosophers like to make distinctions. One way of making distinctions is to engage in some sort of genealogical analysis. To this end, we might work through a genealogy of landlordism, or a theory of rent, or private property. So look, the historically specific social form of capitalist society is realized in the interdependent social spheres of the economy, the state, and the household, which compel individuals to reproduce capitalist society. None of us are immune from this. More narrowly, as anyone that's been paying a little bit of attention, the city of Atlanta has an affordable housing crisis. The rent is too damn high. More than 75% of low-income renters in the city spend more than 30% of their income on rent, and a large portion pay more than half their incomes on rent. Atlanta ranks fifth out of 70 large U.S. cities in the rate of eviction notice per rental home. The median rent for a one-bedroom unit is hovering over $1,600 per month, even upwards of two grand. In some neighborhoods like the West End and Reynoldstown, median rents have increased by more than 60% in the last decade. Over the course of Keisha Lance Bottoms' tenure in office, the citywide median rent increased by about 12%. And while it shows some signs of slowing down, it's still topping off very, very high. Meanwhile, home values in many traditionally lower income neighborhoods have skyrocketed, driven more than a little bit by investors and speculation, especially near the Beltline. Our students live, go to school, and work in the Atlanta metro area, and often have to make tough choices because of the way in which those three things interface. Housing affordability problems, then, have a direct impact on our school, both in terms of turnover and performance, as well as our health and employment. Stable, affordable housing is the critical platform on which healthy families and communities depend. Well, for one, landlords should get a real job. I'm a philosopher, so I'm not sure I'm qualified to give advice, but maybe I can suggest a way to reorient oneself in relation to these different forms of structural injustice, which are highly complex, multifaceted, and rarely have easy solutions. I think Iris Marin Young is right to point out that we each bear some responsibility for ca causally contributing to structural processes that produce and reproduce injustice. As individuals, we should confront the questions of structural injustice by reflecting on our own duties and ideals. This is what Hannah Arendt calls political responsibility. It's political because it requires that we exchange, defend, and take on different views regarding our shared social conditions. So the stranger is someone that's a stranger to me, sure, but they're part of a world that I bear responsibility for. There's nobody in the city or really on this planet whose conditions are completely disconnected from mine because my own life conditions help shape the entire city and really the entire planet as much as those things condition me. Since we're talking about housing inequality, individuals can reorient themselves by thinking whether or not, say, renting an Airbnb is making someone's life worse. Communities can reorient themselves by asking, why do they find middle housing so threatening? And not least, the university would do well to think seriously about how it interfaces with the surrounding communities when it gobbles up buildings and land. And really, it should continually ask whether or not its presence is mutually beneficial. And if it's not, they should be asking what ought to be done. So there's a photo on my office door on campus that shows a guy walking a bunch of dogs. The guy walking the dogs has the label philosophy, and the dogs on the leash have labels like physics, math, psychology, biology, political science, sociology, and economics. While I'm not necessarily prepared right now to argue in favor of this picture of how the disciplines hang together, I will say it's not altogether wrong. One thing that comes to mind is Adorno's new categorical imperative. I take him seriously when he says much of his work is an attempt to articulate what he calls a new categorical imperative after Auschwitz. 
By this, he means that theory and praxis need to be configured in such a way that the Holocaust does not repeat itself. This, I think, is something that intersects with and makes demands of every discipline. From the study of technology to behavioral economics that drills down to how people make choices to the psychology of perpetrators and the biology of life sciences that studies how to sustain life in an increasingly hostile climate and to literature that helps us understand cultures and experiences that are different from our own.